I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater All the Moving Parts, a fascinating chat with opinionated experts about the state of Broadway in the aftermath of the Tony Awards. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to Theater All the Moving Parts, coming to you from the Civilian in the Theater District. Joining me for a post-Tony Awards chat about the state of Broadway are critics Helen Shaw of New York Magazine and Adam Feldman of Time Out New York. Also, Jan Simpson, theater journalist and host of the Broadway radio shows Stagecraft and All the Drama. Welcome to all you fabulous experts. And thank you so much for participating in this roundtable, Post Tonys. I would like to start off our conversation by asking each of you, in a word or two or three, uh, the state of Broadway, how you would describe it in, through the lens of the Tony voters. Let's start with you, Jan. Volatile. Volatile. Yeah. I think there was a lot of excitement about Broadway's return and a lot of hopefulness, but nervousness um, about whether or not all of the tourists, all of the viewers will come back, theater goers will come back, whether or not some of the initiatives that were started this season will continue next season. I agree. I would build on that and say something maybe like uh, emerging or re-emerging. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but it's sort of, sort of a more positive light. But the emerging is one of those words that we used, we tend to use for smaller artists who are just finding their way. But uh, it feels like Broadway is on those tentative baby feet right now. But also th there was a quality, at least in some of the winners, of what we traditionally would call emerging artists. You know, uh, people like Michael, J Michael Jackson, uh, the Dana H winning two awards. These are a new kind of theater for Broadway. Uh, so that's encouraging for me. Helen. Uh, uh, British, <laughs> and uh, you know, in a when an earthquake hits a town, uh, the the buildings that are still standing are the ones with the foundations, uh, the ones that have already prepared for something like an earthquake, and it is clear that the investments that the British theatre culture makes in its artists uh, mm. is that foundation. Um, after even after the earthquake that hit our industry. Those are the artists who are still uh, able to make the choice to be in theatrical productions. Uh, those are the productions that are still ready to move across the pond. We'll get to the British invasion a little later, <laughs> but the big winner, and you named the, the person, Adam, that's Michael R. Jackson and A Strange Loop. That, that well, was... Yes, but in some ways he was the big winner, and in some ways it was a very narrow win, mm -hmm. uh, because Strange Loop won for Best Musical, which I, I'm very excited about, and Michael won for Best Book of a Musical, but it didn't win for Best Score of a Musical, mm -hmm. as many had thought it Six would. Six won. Right, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it didn't win for Best Actor, uh, and it didn't win for Best Featured Actor, or any of the other things that people thought it had a real a shot at. So uh, it was a win, and it was something to be celebrated, if you're me, because I really love that show. But it does speak to you know, uh, how the, na the voters were trying to navigate, were trying to thread the needle between these sort of larger productions uh, that have more of a traditional popular appeal and a production of uh, significant artistic merit, like strangely. It captured the headlines in the uh, post-Tony wrap-ups. Jan, what does the win of A Strange Loop mean for the future of Broadway? I don't think we know. Um, a lot of small musicals have won over the past few years. We've had Fun Home and the Bands Visit. I think one of the things that's unusual about this year is uh, the number of voters who could actually vote. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the out-of-town voters were not able to get into town to see some of the shows. Um, a lot of people who did come in to see shows weren't able to see all of the people who were in the shows. I was surprised that Miles Frost won for Best Actor because he was out quite a bit. In um, MJ, obviously, yeah, playing in Michael MJ. Jackson. Um, he had injuries. I think he had COVID. Um, 
And so the voting was a little skewed towards the people who are in the New York area. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't quite the people on the road and what they think can play and what will sell um, once you get outside of New York. So I don't know uh, that A Strange Loop tells us that, okay, Broadway is ready to do all kinds of shows. We wanna know what's going on in New York. Helen, uh, it's the most explicit, most raw and honest musical, arguably, that we've seen ever, I think, on Broadway. Should it carry a warning label? A warning label? No. Uh, you know, I, my parents are classicists. And I do this terrible thing to them, which is every time they come to New York, I take them to something shocking. And I don't mean to do it, you know, I never intend, but somehow we wind up at PS122 and something absolutely naked is happening. And I will, at the end of this event, I will turn to my mother and I will say, I am so sorry. And she'll say, Helen, I have seen Aristophanes in the original Greek. And the, Thing is, that has prepared her for the entire range of artistic outpouring in the city. And so it is a very old thing. It is a very ancient, ancient thing for us to use the theater to shock each other and to speak frankly about sex. Mm. So in that way, no, it shouldn't carry a warning label, um, just the sort of crown of Dionysus. Adam, a strange loop. What do you think in terms of its place in musical history? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, it has a lot of, I, mean, I hope it has a, an ongoing place in musical history. Uh, it's for future generations to tell us that, I think. But I, I think the show itself is doing something very interesting right now, which is it is centering uh, a black queer, self-identified black queer fat body in the middle of a, a a, a tradition, a tradition of introspection and uh, musical introspection that has traditionally been res you know, reserved for mostly, at least ostensibly, straight white men and sometimes women, uh, but written by men usually. Uh, so that uh, that does change the game a little bit. It expands the game to include a group of people or a type of person, but also really by extension a whole a whole different many different types of people. Um, by uh, you know, but but at the same time, it, as as Michael took pains to say in his acceptance speech, uh, it isn't just about representation. It has to also be about accomplishment and excellence. And uh, I think that you get a sense from him <laughs> that uh, he bristles at being merely reduced to uh, just being black and queer. It's his accomplishments as an artist that I think he wants to foreground, and I think that the show does that. What's extraordinary is obviously in the tribute to Sondheim, he was saying, you know, write what you feel, write as daring as you can. And Deirdre O'Connell gave the best mm -hmm. line of the night, which is, don't be afraid to be weird. And he exemplified both of those things. And I think that probably inspires people that are out there that may be ushers now in theaters to be as weird as he was. I think they were also congratulating the fact that it was raw and not mm -hmm. raw solely in terms of sex. It was emotionally raw. It was someone almost like slicing their veins mm -hmm. and just showing it to the world. And that kind of emotion, that kind of truth um, which also reveals beauty. That kind of truth and beauty is, I think, what was being celebrated as much as the representation. Helen, you were gonna say? Artists have so much capacity, have choices between the things that they will make, that they look at the path before them and they can go towards the commercial, the safe, the, uh, the sure to do well in the room with the producers, or they can choose the weird art. They can go left. And she says, go left, do go Wittershins. You know, there's nothing to lose but your whole life. And that's what we're playing with anyway. And it was, I, so I think 
The other thing that um, is so important about A Strange Loop is it took 20 years to make. Mm -hmm. And it took 20 years to make, which means that he had to choose it for 20 years. He did not ever say, I guess it's going nowhere. Although he actually, I think, said that. He probably <laughs> did say that. Yeah, he probably, probably did say that. Volume, yeah. you know, but, but kept kind of getting up in the morning and being like, I'm going to choose this one. We should say that Deirdre O'Connell won the Tony for Dana H, which itself was weird. Weird. Uh, part of the weird. Gorgeous art. weird. Um, obviously, the two most uh, Tonys, the Tonys went to uh, Lehman Trilogy, talking about the British invasion to some extent that you were talking about earlier, and also to Company. Do you think that the wins for Company were carried on the waves of affection for Stephen Sondheim? I, I liked this revival of Company very much. Uh, I think certainly the nostalgia factor for the late Stephen Sondheim didn't hurt it. Uh, but also, it, it's a big show in a way that some of the other, it's a big and classy show in the way that some of the others weren't. Also, Company is British, also this production of Company is mm -hmm. British, uh, directed by a Brit who was originally produced in, you know, in England. And boy, we really love the Brits this year. Uh, I mean, in fairness, it's not just that it's post-earthquake. These productions were pre-earthquake as well. They were already scheduled to come over. Uh, they, they, they do reflect this long tradition of investment by the public sphere into the arts in that country, which we very regrettably don't have. Here. Marianne Elliott obviously won the Best Director of a Musical uh, Tony Award. Is it time to sort of say that a woman winning the Best Director Award is not an anomaly? Uh, I think this is about the eighth or the ninth woman who has won. Have we now finally settled? And four of the Tony nominees were female as well between the plays and the... Uh, where do you think that the state is in terms of women's participation on Broadway? I think that it's telling that when women accept these awards, they talk about the difficulties that they've faced in getting there, uh, in the rooms that were inhospitable to them, but, and I take them at their word. So if they say that it is still difficult, then I think it is still difficult. Jan, what do you think? One of the things that really heartened me was that two of the nominees for best director of a play were black women. We had Camille Brown and uh, Liliana Blaine Cruz, and both relatively young women. And so there's the potential to see much more um, coming from them. We've had a number of women win, uh, particularly for musicals. Uh, over uh, the years, I think it's you know I think it's hard for everyone mm. to break into this business. Mm -hmm. um, probably harder for women, probably harder and harder for Black women. But um, I think we are seeing little cracks. What's going to be interesting is looking forward because this year in particular, or this season. Um, Broadway patted itself on the back a lot for the fact that it had uh, seven plays by black playwrights uh, open. They all opened maybe with one exception in the fall mm -hmm. when we were very nervous about the return of Broadway. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward um, when it's not so much uh, sending the canaries into the coal mine. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we'll see. MJ won four Tony Awards, twice as much as A Strange Loop. Do you think that this will go anywhere toward the rehabilitation of Michael Jackson's image? It's interesting. Um, people I know, particularly on Twitter and other social media platforms, are really upset uh, about MJ's success. But Michael Jackson's image as a musician has not been hurt by his reputation as a person. People still play Michael Jackson music. They still love Michael Jackson music. And they've just made this division. And MJ is selling, you know, it's selling twice as many tickets as um, uh, A Strange Loop. And people go and they love uh, dancing in their seats to that show. 
Where do you fall on the whole Michael Jackson MJ question? <clears throat> well, I'm, I, I'm very ambivalent about the show itself and about the existence of the show. It's not the show, it's, the show itself does a very good job within its brief. The problem is the nature of the brief for the problem for me. But, that, but I also recognize that there are a lot of people, you were talking about people on Twitter who are upset about the success of the show. There are also a lot of people on Twitter, and I know this because I reviewed MJ, who feel very strongly that <laughs> MJ, uh, that Michael Jackson himself was innocent and was the victim of uh, a media smear and that we're all participating in it as critics or, or, or whatever, journalists. Uh, and uh, they... Uh, and then there's a so there's a there's a huge surprisingly large contingent of such people, and then there's a whole other perhaps even larger than both contingent that says, I accept what I believe to be true about Michael Jackson about the bad things that I believe that I accept are likely to be true that's in their minds, uh, but I am able to make the separation and still enjoy, Michael Jackson's been dead for some time. I have these associations that are important to me. I am able to make that separation in my head. And this musical is for them. It's for people who either believe that he's innocent or have come to a place in their own minds where they can accept that even though he may not be innocent, they can still enjoy his work. Helen, can you, can you separate the art from the artist or the artist from the art? I think that it would be easier to do in the case of MJ if it didn't have its book scenes. And when it operates as essentially a concert by an impersonator, it is uh, thrilling. It really is. Uh, it is, I'm grateful to see those moves on the human body again. I kind of thought it would just be, I would go to Las Vegas and have to see a hologram, you know? And those are, as you say, the, the craft is unsullied because the, the craft was, was so profound. Um, the human is sullied, and the uh, efforts by Lenottage to dance around these issues in the book uh, are one of the reasons why, for me, it's, it's actually uh, repugnant. So the, the question of that musical as being a way to rehabilitate his, rela his relationship to the public? Yes. Yes, of course. The musical as a way to rehabilitate his image and his... Uh, Reputation as a person, no, failure. You, you mentioned Camille Brown, obviously, and mm -hmm. Ileana, is it? Ili Liliana. Uh, Liliana. Liliana. Liliana um, who, who may have lost last night, but who points to a bright future for Broadway? Who among the nominees would you say uh, may not have won a Tony, but really will we'll see more of, and we're looking to see more of? Well, Joaquina Calacango, who did win yeah. a Tony, uh, is an exceptional talent. And I, I, I remember I saw her in a, in a show off Broadway called Hurt Village a, a few years ago. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, who is, because she was quite young at yep, that time. Yep. And I remember thinking, who is this person? Exactly. And when am I going to get to see her again? And then we did get to see her a bunch of times in a row because she was in she, uh, FNA, uh, let's say on TV. Uh, and, and, and she was Slave, in the yeah, Our Lady of Slave. Slave. And, yeah, and, and then, of course, last year she was in um, Slave Play on Broadway. Uh, and uh, and it's so exciting. She was in Color Purple, but that, that part nobody ever remembers. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, she is so exceptional, and I don't care for um, Paradise Square particularly as a musical, or even for that big song that, that she gets at the end. But she grabs it by the horns, man, <laughs> and she made that whole theater shake. And when she won that award, there was I think there was a standing ovation. Am I yes. yeah yeah. Uh, just on the basis of the strength of having seen her moments before pull that out of her body. Yeah. Ellen, uh, who among the nominees or winners point to a bright future? Dee Dee O'Connell. So she, <laughs> uh, so I screamed. Uh, I was on headphones. I live in a studio apartment with my husband who does not care. And so he had me on headphones. Uh, he also doesn't like it. His name is Bobby, and I sing that song from company to him quite a lot, and he didn't need to hear it again. So uh, I was on headphones, and I shouted and frightened him when Dee Dee won. Now, is Dee Dee going to come back to Broadway? 
She is overdue. She is one of the greatest actors in New York in the field, bar none. He was ranting. I guess he was high on something. I'm not really sure. But he was ranting and, and, and raging, and his hands were flailing as he was being expressive and everything. And he, he demonstrated how a guy hit him, and that's when he hit me. Adam, who were you most emotionally invested in? Oh, also Didi O'Connell. I have to say, I, I did the same thing as Helen. Also, I have to say, when, when Michael R. Jackson won for Best Book, mm -hmm. because up until then, Strange Loop had not won anything, right. and it was starting to look like maybe it would be, uh, a, a, you know, an exclusion situation, and I, everyone was very nervous. And everyone in my apartment just said the same thing, like, oh, thank God. Jan? Well, what were you most emotionally sorry, invested in? Sorry, but it was <laughs> Didi O'Connell. <laughs> She is such a great actor, and I didn't think she had a chance. I was happy to see uh, Six win for score. I think that's a controversial show in a way. Some people dismiss it as a concert. I love the fact that it's um, by these fresh, young British people. Um, <laughs> not that, you know, the British part, but that these fresh, young people who are doing something different um, and have the potential to bring more people uh, into uh, the theater. theater. Would you say this was the most inclusive Tonys that we've seen in history with non-binary The Tonys trans? are always pretty inclusive by, by award show standards. Mm -hmm. they're, the, they're always the most inclusive by award show standards. Uh, there, there's always a lot of gay representation in particular, LGBTQ representation, I should say. Uh, and so this year there was certainly a lot more of that. One of the winners for Six is non-binary. Uh, one of the nominees for Featured Actress is, is openly trans. Uh, this is, this is you know, incremental that was, um, change. Uh, El Morgan the name Lee. of the openly trans. Uh, El Morgan Lee. El Morgan Lee and uh, from, a strange From Strange from Loop. Uh, and so, the, you know, th that's, all, that's all good. But just in a word, since I started with <laughs> in a word, uh, in a word, what do you hope for Broadway? Uh, since I know that you don't hope for much, Helen, we'll start with you. I know, I know. I always thought that I was such a sunny person. Um, <laughs> I, what do I hope for Broadway? Mm -hmm. I, well, this is a bit mean, but I hope that she uh, works out how to get more people into the seats. I have sat in so many excellent shows this year, so many excellent shows that have half-empty orchestras because it is a, it's a rough time right now. It's a hard time to sell a ticket. One of my favorite shows of the year for Colored Girls. And it was a show that was not, as it came towards its closing, selling a lot of tickets. And so my hope for Broadway, which is we had new kinds of shows on Broadway this season, exciting shows. We had, in some ways, new audiences because of those new shows. Retain them, develop them, and seat them. That's what I hope for. In a word, Adam? Oh, what she said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, the, the audience right now, I think, is the challenge. And, and my hope is that they will be able to find ways to reach larger audiences and different kinds of audiences and also do it with artistically interesting and challenging material. That's the, that's the rub, because you don't want them to be just be, you know, uh, playing to the worst instincts of, of, a, of, a, of a large audience. You want it to maintain standards while also expanding itself. Uh, so that's my hope. And Jan, you had started this conversation by saying, we're, we've, we're seeing a trend. The important things is to see the longevity of these things that are now mm -hmm. happening. Is that what you hope for? Um, I'm hoping for inclusivity behind the curtain. Um, Adam was saying we traditionally have uh, diversity, inclusion in acting categories, but in terms of the craft categories, mm -hmm. in terms of sound and design and direction and producing, we need to get more diverse voices. Um, if you have that kind of diversity, then it will grow. Um, different kinds of storytelling, different kinds of shows, and those shows will bring in different kinds of audiences. So that's my hope for true inclusion. Great. 
hope's a good word to land on, uh, and our discussion. I thank you so much for this, and on to the next season. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and professionals as New York Theatre, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.